Okay, chapter 10. This is the acquisition and subsequent investments on property, plant, and equipment. So property, plant, and equipment is tangible fixed assets. Things with a physical substance. Land, buildings, equipment, delivery trucks, taxis, fleet vehicles, computer equipment, desk chairs, things like that. Tangible. Depreciation is the systematic allocation of tangible long-term assets. These are also assets that are used to produce revenue. A good example is you buy a piece of land, you're going to expand at some point in time in the future, build a new store, build a new restaurant, build a new warehouse, an office building, Sometime down the road, you're going to use it, but you're not using it now, that's an investment. That's a long-term investment. You have to currently be utilizing it to produce revenue. Unless you've got some sort of seasonal, sometimes people have you know, equipment that they use leading up to Christmas and then come January, February, they don't use it for six months, that's still being used. So you still depreciate that type of equipment, okay? Historical cost is the basis by which we record tangible property, plant, and equipment. This is where the U.S. differs with the rest of the world. The rest of the world under the international financial reporting standards allows businesses to elect, it doesn't require them, but it allows them to elect to write up and write down assets based upon their increase or decrease in fair market value. This is not something we allow in the United States, and it's been a 60 to 80 year debate. And the argument for it, which I commonly hear, the example I use, is the 43 acres that Coca-Cola owns in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. They have a compound there that the Coca-Cola Tower is built on. They have some research and development labs and all sorts of buildings on these 43 acres. Well, Coca-Cola bought these acres in the late 1800s. Needless to say, there's been a slight change in fair market value from the historical cost. But I have, in one of my slide packs, which I think is in the next one, I have a property tax assessment on that property. And it shows from 2005 to 2006 to 2007 steady increases in value of that property. And then in 2008 it flattened up, and then in 2009 it plummeted. Well, Coca-Cola didn't do anything. Nothing changed. They owned the 43 acres before. They still own the 43 acres. But if we had allowed them under U.S. GAAP to write those gains up, they'd have been taking gains to their income statement. This isn't like unrealized gains to a um, security held for investment. This is to the income statement. If they write that up, then in 2009, when the whole world was plummeted into a worldwide recession and Coca-Cola could least afford a write-down, they would have had written down that property. Tens, tens of millions of dollars. So we don't do it in the United States, okay? Historical cost. We're going to then allocate that over the life of the property. And we'll talk about this more in Chapter 11 when we get into actual calculations of depreciation. But we're going to allocate this in a systematic manner based upon the depreciable base. So there's question number one. What is the depreciable base? Does anybody remember from principles? Anybody got a guess? The initial cost less... No, close, salvage value, residual value. 
okay? Because you only want to allocate the depreciation expense equal to the amount that it actually depreciates from its original historical cost down to what you can scrap it for. What do you, when you're done with it, how much is it worth? That's what we want to expense. All right, and we'll see in Chapter 11, we've got a multitude of options on how to go about expensing it. All right, so depreciation is only associated with tangible property, plant, and equipment. Natural resources get depleted, and intangible properties, patents, trademarks, things like that, copyrights, get amortized. All right, so this is only stuff that you can hold touch, tangible. All right, acquisition cost is everything necessary to place the asset into service. All right? So in the case of land, it's not just the contract that you negotiate for the purchase price of the land. It's any legal fees that you have to incur in order to close the deal. It's any surveys that you may have to go out to lay out the borders of the land in order to get a clear, a clear and free title. It might be title insurance, back taxes. If the seller of this land has not been paying their property taxes and you part of your contract, you have agreed to pay the taxes in arrears, that's part of your acquisition cost. If there's an existing dilapidated building on the land that you're going to have to tear down in order to build your building, that is part of the acquisition cost. Whatever it takes to get it ready to pl be placed into service. If you have to pay the municipal government to hook water lines or electrical lines or to pave the road to give you access to your land. That's all cost associated with acquiring the land. All right, yes? What if like, the previous owner gives you credit to tear down that? Well, then you net out the... Because okay. you, you also may be able to salvage the stuff. I mean, a lot of times with old buildings, you pay a salvage company to come in and they'll, especially if there's any copper wiring in there, they'll pay you to go pull the copper wiring out and then they go re, you know, sell it to the scrap. So if you had to pay $10,000 to demolish it, but you were able to get $9,000 in scrap or a credit from the old uh, seller, then you credit that and include the net. Okay. All right. So here's an example. You spent $150,000, you had to tear down an old building, you paid $3,500 for title insurance, you had to survey the land, and delinquent taxes were $1,100. The current year's taxes is the only thing in this list that gets expense, so that's just property ta tax expense. That's a normal operating expense. But everything else goes into the capitalization of the land. All right, equipment, well, this is buildings, let's see. Equipment can be very complicated and at first blush, not very obvious as to what is involved in putting that equipment into place for service to generate revenue. So it's obviously the contract price, less any purchase discounts. So if the vendor is giving you 2%, if you pay within 10 days, Subtract that from the contract price. Any freight in, if it's FOB shipping point, if you're paying the freight, plus any insurance on, on insuring the shipment till you get there, you may have to come in and rent a crane to pick this piece of heavy equipment up off of the back of the flatbed truck. You may have to go rent a mechanized dolly that you set it on in order to wheel it through your factory. You may have to buy or rent a smaller crane to come into your factory to pick it up off the dolly and place it wherever you're going to put it. And then you've got to build safety railings around it. You might have to build ramps. Everything involved you should capture. And that's a very, very common new accountant kind of exercise. 
So don't be surprised if you someday in your not too distant career are asked to capture fixed assets. The other thing that many accountants omit is, is that during the installation, assembly, or testing cost, you can also capitalize internal labor. So if you're taking some of your factory workers to go out there and assist in the installation and calibration and testing of this new piece of equipment, you can capture all that into a work order, fully burden it with payroll taxes and, and fringe benefits, and take that straight to the asset side of the balance sheet. Don't leave that on the table, because if you don't, what does it become? It becomes manufacturing overhead, and that adversely affects net income. So you want to capture this. I mean, I, I had a six-month implementation at the last aerospace company on a piece of software that was designed or sold to us to help, and it didn't work. They scrapped it about a year after I left. I didn't buy it. All I did was try to get it to work. And so I had teams of people, engineers and human resources and operations people and accountants that were working together to design and implement this software. I had them all, even though these were salaried employees, I had them all fill out timesheets and I captured every minute that they worked on that project and added it to the software cost. It's, full, it's just, it's proper gap. So don't leave things on the table because if you leave it on the table, don't put it to the balance sheet. It goes to your bottom line. All right, so here's a contract price of $100,000. The terms are 210 net 30. They pay within the discount period. They had to pay freight in on an FOB shipping point, $2,500. And then they spent $3,000 on installation and testing, $7,000 in sales tax, and then during the installation, they dinged up the machine and had to pay $500 to repair it. The $500 is the only thing that doesn't get capitalized. Everything else in that list is, a, is added up for the debit to machine. Because this is repair and maintenance. This is not, it was not, it was an accident. So you expense that accident because you, I don't know, you ran a forklift into it or something. It happens. You know, they picked the crane up and dropped it or something. I mean, all sorts of crazy things happen when you're dealing with very, very large heavy equipment. Avoid it. Stand back. You're the accountant. <laughs> Don't get too close. Leasehold improvements. This is, an, this is a, another very, very common. When you sign a lease on an office, space, a retail space, a warehouse space, much of what you put into the lease, building walls, putting in a drop ceiling, installing a security system, installing a computer system, putting outside lights on the outside so that your employees can safely walk to their cars at night, anything that you bolt to the building you don't own, you give up the rights to. When you end your lease, they don't let you come in and start taking down lights and pulling the wires back out of the wall and all that. It's written into the lease. Whatever is installed on the lessor's property becomes their property. All right? It's even worse, the airport out there. As you're driving up 281, all those big orange hangers out at the airport, I built all those as a controller as a 28-year-old way out of my league. I had no business having that job. 28, 29-year-old controller. I was the, it was called the D. Howard Company back then. Those are a nice little lease because all that land out there is owned by the airport authority, the city of San Antonio. The minute you build a building, those big enormous hangars, millions of dollars, the minute we finished the building and got a certificate of occupancy, we no longer owned them. They belonged to the city of San Antonio. And then we leased that back from them. It's the craziest deal in the world, but they've got the runway. So we didn't have a choice. Yeah. So pretty much all the expenses is inherited by them. So all the depreciation expenses of that building, it's on them. 
Well, they but they're a city. They're a city, so they probably don't depreciate it. They just list it as an asset. It becomes an asset for yeah. the city of San Antonio. Yeah, because it's not like I can use it. If once my lease runs out, if the city doesn't renew my lease, I can't exactly tear the darn thing down and haul it off. So it's not. I, I have no rights to it under that lease. So leasehold improvements are amortized, even if you put in a security system that's going to last for 10 years, or a lighting, external lighting, that's going to last normally for 10 years. If your lease is only for five, you can only amortize it over the five year. All right? And this is another area where you amortize leasehold improvements, not depreciate them. Because technically, the minute you install it to the lessor's building, you no longer own it. So it's no longer your tangible property. It's, a, it's an intangible leasehold improvement. All right? So that's an odd little area. And can be extensive. I mean, you spend lots and lots of money getting make ready, they call it, for a leased property to move into. All right. So economic benefit. Retirement obligation. This you may or may not run into in your career. If you have a contractual obligation up front to do something at the end, you need to present value whatever estimated cost of that end is to the present day and capitalize that. And I'll show you an example. I love their little uh, line here such as the decommissioning of a nuclear power plant at the end of its useful life. If you know up front, more common is this, you know, you go out, you buy a piece of land outside of San Antonio, and you're going to quarry cement out of it. That's what they dig up around here and put in those aggregate trucks that you see all over town. The rocks falling out of it and always breaking your windshield, that's quarries on the outside of town. You see them when you fly in, big holes in the ground. Well, a lot of municipalities, especially up in the Appalachian Mountains and such, require now that you reclaim the land when it's done. You do something to the land to give it an alternative source, an alternative use, rather than just leaving a big ugly hole in the ground. All right? That cost, you need to determine up front during the acquisition and capitalize it as part of the land. So here's a good example. You're leasing a building to put in a, a retail store. Ten years. You spend $100,000 to finish out the interior of the store. The lease requires that you take all that stuff out at the end of your lease and return it to its original condition. This is a very common with, in the case of historical property. If it's an old building, they'll require you return it back into its original state. So you estimate up front that 10 years from now, it's going to cost you $31,125 to restore Take out all your retail fixtures and restore that building to the way you found it. At a 10% interest rate, that has a present value. This is table number three in your present value tables at the end of chapter five. Factor will bring it down to $12,000. All right? That's today's dollars for $31,125 spent 10 years from now. Okay? Capitalize that, you spent 100000 in cash, and then you create an asset retirement obligation for $12,000. This is a liability that you're then going to add to every year in what is called accretion expense. It's not interest expense. It's another one of those that you put down in the other items on your multi-step income statement. An accretion expense for the first year would be $1,200, 10% of the $12,000. So it's going to be a debit to accretion expense, a credit to asset retirement obligation. So now you've got $13,200 in here. $1,320 would be the accretion expense for the second year. 
so forth and so on, at the end of 10 years, this liability will be equal to $31,125. You go out, you pay the demolition and the restoration team to restore the building to its original condition, and you offset it against that liability. That's the way that works. If you see that in your career, keep your intermediate book. If you see that in your career, a retirement obligation, that's how you'll treat it. Hopefully you see it early in your career, because 15, 20 years from now, you'll spend weeks figuring this out. <laughs> so, because you'll go, what? I got to do what? It's a very strange little transaction. Lump sum purchases, very common. This is where you, for a single purchase price, you buy more than one asset. The most common example they use is always land in a building. You buy one piece of property under one contract, but it really is made up of two pieces of property because land is not depreciable. A building is. So you have to split it, and you split it based on the pro rata value of its fair market value. All right? So if the values, the appraised values total 125, land of it is 50, so 50 one twenty-fifth time the purchase price, 48,000 is the debit to land, 72,000 is the debit to building. Split it. Now, once again, in the international arena, under the international financial reporting standards, this gets much more complicated because IFRS requires something called component depreciation. And when I teach the graduate course in IFRS, the example I use there is an airline buying an aircraft, right? So you buy an aircraft for $45 million. In the United States, you just depreciate it over its 10, 15, 20 year life, whatever you've elected, right? Because it's one aircraft. Under the IFRS, it's an airframe plus avionics plus two engines plus an interior, each of which have different useful lives. Because an airline probably doesn't use an interior for more than about five years. Avionics need a major upgrade maybe every 10. And then the engines have to be, depending upon how often you fly the darn thing, the engines have to be pulled off and, and uh, overhauled about every three to five. So you depreciate each individual. Like a building, you build a high-rise office building. Well, you've got a roof. The roof is going to wear out way before the building does. You've got heating and air conditioning systems. You have an elevator, maybe six. All of those are different, and they all have to be separated out in this manner under a lump sum purchase allocation, whatever the fair market value is, and then separately capitalized. So pray that we never adopt the international financial reporting standards here in America while you are running the fixed asset system. <laughs> Maybe you'll get promoted beyond that, then we can adopt it. So, because it would be very complicated. All right, I'm not gonna look that. Non-interest bearing notes. We talked, we touched about this last chapter. So here's a piece of equipment, and we'll do some examples of this come Thursday. Here's a piece of equipment that we're buying on a five-year non-interest bearing note, $10,000, all right? Five equal payments of $2,000 apiece. Go to table four because the first payment is at the end of the period, at the end of each year. So this is an ordinary annuity. It's not an annuity due. And I'll do a, a contrasting problem set on Thursday to show you the difference between the two, all right? So you go to table number four, you look up the factor under 10% for five periods, and you get a factor, and you multiply it times the 2,000, and you wind up with $7,210. That's the true present value of the equipment that you're buying. Even though you're paying 10,000 in cash, you're paying it in the future. So you set up a discount on notes payable and the equipment is only 7200. And then you would amortize this using the effective interest rate 
you've got an option, either the effective interest rate or the straight line rate. Uh, you amortize that interest as interest expense over the life of the note. So we'll do problems like that. Securities. Not all purchases of tangible property, plant, and equipment involve cash. The temptation, especially when you're new, startup, is to give stock. Now, forget the accounting for a second. I'm advising you to not do that. Because what is your true cost of giving up stock to purchase something in a company that you own? What are you giving away? You're giving away equity. You're giving away all future growth. So the cautionary tale I have here is Mark, the Facebook guy, Zuckerberg, is that his name? He paid a street graffiti artist. Have you seen that? To come in and paint a mural in the Facebook headquarters. And he gave them stock in Facebook. His own stock. He had excess. He told him, like, no, he was like, so I'll give you cash. And he was like, no, why don't you just give me stock? <laughs> He'd accepted cash if he'd have stuck with it. Yeah. That may be the artist's story. I bet Mark has a different story. Yeah, you know what that mural cost? Tens of millions of dollars. By the time Facebook eventually went public, tens of millions of dollars for that darn thing for just a mural. Don't do that. <laughs> okay? Don't give up stock. Borrow money somewhere. It's always cheaper. So, two methods, and we'll, we'll see a couple of examples of this. When you acquire a piece of fixed assets through stock, if the stock is actively traded on an open market, you use that valuation. So the example here is 10,000 shares trading currently on an active market at $15 a share. Okay? $150,000 is the cost of the land. That's what you capitalize and then split it based upon par value, $1 par between the common and the additional paid in capital. Option one, stock with an actively traded market. Option two, what if there wasn't an actively traded market for this stock? for these 10,000 shares. What's the only alternative? This makes perfect logical sense. What are you buying? You're buying land, right? You're going to have a fair market value on the land and you capitalize it based on that. So if you don't have a value from an active market for the stock, then you rely on the fair market value of the asset you're acquiring. So if the land was worth 120,000, you would debit 120,000, put in the 10,000 for $1 par, and then the other hand 110,000 at that point would be additional paid in capital on common stock. So stock price or the fair market value of the asset you're acquiring. You're never going to see that. All right, exchanges, this does happen, and I'll just get to the slide where in, and explain this. Um, you've got a building, let's say you're Arnold Company. You've got a building, it's worth $40,000. It's currently got a book value of $46,000. You need a piece of equipment. You don't need this building. So you go find this carbon company who has a $40,000 fair market value piece of equipment, and you trade it, all right? So on our books, we're trading an item that has a book value of $46,000 for a $40,000 item. So we have a loss. So we debit the equipment for forty. dollars we remove the accumulated depreciation on the building of fifty-four dollars and the $100,000 original cost, and we take a loss on exchange. The equipment guy has a building now worth 40000 
They removed the 32 of accumulated depreciation and the 60 of original historical cost, but they now have a $12,000 gain because they gave up an asset that is written on their books of 28 and they got a 40 back. So they have a gain. And that would be the same whether there was some cash involved. So the cash just offsets it a little bit. All right? So I'm not going to worry about this one. All right, so here's the other major topic in here. Self-constructed assets, whether it's a piece of equipment or a building or a warehouse, if you're building it yourself, there are two items that you can capitalize out of your overhead cost. The cost of your direct material and labor is obvious. If you've got your construction employees out there building your office building, their labor goes in. But you can also capitalize the overhead on their labor. The cost to supervise them, the cost to insure them, the cost of their fringe benefits, all the other stuff can be removed out of your overhead and put to the building, the self-constructed asset. All right. The other thing that you get to capitalize is interest. You get to capitalize interest on the funds that you, a weighted average expenditure of funds. All right. The way this works, and this is what we'll spend most of the time doing problems on the board associated with this, is, is that you get to capitalize actual or imputed so you don't actually have to borrow money on this particular project. As long as you're borrowing money for other purposes, you can take a piece of that interest and capitalize it to the asset. So let's look at it. What we're looking for is called avoidable interest. So what kind of interest is being in, imputed or paid in actuality? because this construction project is going on. So let's look at an example. We start a project, we're going to spend $1.2 million building our corporate headquarters. Here's the expenditures in January, April, October, and December. We outlay these funds to buy material, to pay direct labor, to do whatever with. The total cost. We had two pieces of outstanding unrelated notes, one at 12% and one at 13%. These were there before we started this building. OK? Two options. One, we go out and we borrow a $1 million construction loan at 10% for the sole purposes of constructing this building. All right, this is actual interest, not imputed, because we're actually borrowing this money. So the first thing you do is get a weighted average of the expenditures. The 200000 that we spent on January 1, we spent for the whole year. The stuff that we spent on April 1 was only three quarters of the year. So that's 262. October 1, December 31st, zero. Zero months on that one. So in total, we have on average throughout the year 587500 Multiply that by the 10% construction loan and you get $58,750 worth of capitalizable interest. So that's how you calculate how much. It is limited to actual interest paid. But what do we actually pay? We paid 100,000 on that million that we borrowed on the construction loan. We spent 240,000 on that 12% note, and the 13% note cost us 540. So in actuality, in this particular example, we had 860,000 of actual interest. We're only going to capitalize 58,750. In other words, you can't make money on this. You can't have negative interest. Does that make sense? OK. So the journal entry is going to be we're going to reduce the total interest expense. 
Because remember, it was 860000 in total. So I'd be, as we've been paying that interest. And remove that and take it to buildings or construction process if the building's not finished. Okay? So that's this one. What if we didn't borrow a million, we only borrowed 400? Well, our weighted average is higher than what we borrowed. So in this case, we need to impute interest over and above the construction loan. So for that 187,500, which is the amount above the 400 we borrowed, we multiplied times a weighted average interest rate on those two outstanding notes. So you take the 240 plus the 520, divide the 760 by the total outstanding on those two unrelated notes of six, and you get an imputed interest rate, weighted average, 12.67%. Multiply that by the excess, because we actually paid 40,000 on that construction loan, We've got another 23750 That's 63750 of avoidable interest. We've got to do that. Compare it to the actual interest paid, in this case is 800 and that's, this is what we get to capitalize. So we reduce the total interest expense of 800000 by the $63,756. That one people struggle with, and it shouldn't be. It's, it's just limited to actual interest. Okay? Make sense? All right. This is multiple periods. We'll do that later. Subsequent events. This one here, and this is the last topic, and then you can go. Enjoy the nice sunny day. This is the difference between repair and maintenance versus capitalizing a major improvement to an existing asset. All right, the most common example that I use is you've got a delivery truck. Well, if you put new spark plugs in it, new tires on it, and change the oil, that's maintenance. All right, it's just what you have to incur on an annual basis to keep the truck running. But what if it was a, let's say, a, a useful life of seven years? At the end of six years, you make a management decision to put a new engine in the truck. If you put a new engine in it, at that point, you can run it for another three years. So the total life of the truck, rather than seven, will be nine now. That's a subsequent event. You get to capitalize that. What you do is you take the current book value, the original cost minus the accumulated depreciation, add in the cost of the improvement, the new engine, and then divide that over the now three-year remaining useful life, and you get a new depreciation expense. And that's what you then would depreciate over the next three years. Okay? And that one's a real simple example we'll do on but that's the difference between those two. All right. That's it. Mm -hmm.